Good morning. Welcome, Fellowship. It's good to be back here. Uh, <laughs> it's been a while. This little guy's a month old today, which is weird. Um, you know, he's had lots of appointments, and we went to go see a microbiologist. She was way bigger than I expected. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see how this goes with him up here. He might start fussing. But uh, we have connections throughout the week. Um, first one being Wise Women. Is it still 11? In El Tuna at Cabin Coffee on Monday. Tacos and Prayer is on Tuesday at 6 o'clock at the Palmazic Household. And Man Club starts at 6.30. And is it at the Hammer? It's at the Hammer Residence uh, this week as well. We also, it is a special day for one of us here. It is Quintina's birthday. So if you guys want to join me in singing, happy birthday. So happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Quintina. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Quintina. That was called a distraction for making a transition with him. Um, I'm going to pray, and then I'll hand things over to Kiara for uh, worship. God, thank you so much for this, uh, this place to meet. Uh, you have told us not to forsake this. And uh, as we were reminded in the 9 o'clock hour this morning that um, we are meant to be living sacrifices and that we present ourselves to you uh, to be renewed continually. I just pray that this time would facilitate that and that we'd grow closer to each other and you. Amen. All right, folks. Hi, good morning. You all can uh, sit and stand or whatever. What? who has always got this handled. <laughs> All right, folks, let's praise God together, shall we? I love you, Lord, for your mercy never
you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, okay, we're going directly into the next few folks. It's super convenient for you. You can just stay standing. <laughs> I've seen much more than most, much less than some. Took a while to give up the ghost. start sharing like things like why I pick the songs I pick so uh, I pick the songs that I pick uh, this one today because part of the themes that Perry gave me was uh, forgiveness and I see forgiveness from God as like the love from a parent like not you screwed up but I give you another chance so much as you know like oh honey you fell but I got you but this next song embodies that for me so deeply. It's not meant to be a worship song, but it works so well as a worship song for me because of the way it's just so kind and forgiving. I will see you everywhere you go. Everywhere you go, I will follow you. You stray? Don't worry, I got you. You're not alone. I followed you. You fall? Still not alone. I followed you down. When the old souls of your shoes are worn through, 
it's too far to find your way home you're feeling older than you used to i can't stop thinking you'll be left alone don't you worry now don't let life get you down just remember you're mine and i'll see so cold as you reach for my oldest t-shirt to keep you warm we'll never grow so much. Let's give God and Kiara a round. Hey, ho, hey. That's awesome. Should I delay or are we good? We're good. Awesome. <laughs> well, that's coming up. But before you go, before you come up here, I, I actually have a video. Can you kick that off first? Well, actually, before we do that, 10 Cultural Lies. This is where we are. And uh, uh, we're in the sermon series last week. I uh, talked about uh, the lie was that you are the most important person in the world. And uh, instead, Jesus tells us to take up our crosses and follow after him. That he has a way, he's demonstrated a way, he has modeled the way for you and I to live. That was last week's. This week, it's kind of like that. You're going to hear about it a little bit. But that the world needs you. That you are the Messiah. You're the chosen one. You're the one who's going to fix the whole world and set everything straight. That's the cultural lie that we're going to deal with. Before we do that, I have a two truths and a lie from Dan that's coming up. And before we do that, I'm going to give you some tools, some tricks, some education so that you can tell which is the truth, which are the lies. Go ahead, sir. For our next lovely and talented <laughs> contestant, we've got Dan Radel. Give him a round of applause. Yep. So now that you're equipped, you should have no problems, right? So, right. And he did not know that this was going to be a part of it. Well, see? I could stand really close to you. I got it all figured out. Yep. That was what my, my first truth right there. I got it all figured out. Now I, get, now I added another one. So uh, I, have to, I had to write them down because I would have remembered them. Indifferently, but um, 
Um, when I was babysitting, when I was uh, 12 or 13, I saved a small child from choking on a piece of candy. Um, the next one is I had my tongue stitched back together twice in a 24-hour period. And the third one is when I was 16, I got into an accident, broke my ankle, and because of that, my left leg is now longer than my right leg. Come on now, you've been studying? Okay, what? Candy, got one candy, anyone else candy? Two candies, three candies, what? Four candies, four candies, all right. Five candies, okay, what else? Anyone else? Left leg longer, anyone else? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six of those. That's pretty close. So those are the only two. The tongue one, okay. So any other tongue? It's only because I talk so much. No, okay, so we're not tongue. So, okay, of the other two, which one do you want to go with? The leg or the candy? Leg, okay, so it seems like leg is the majority, and the answer is? Actually, my left leg is shorter. Oh, <laughs> so it is a leg. Because awesome. of the accident. Though. Yep, awesome. <laughs> Very good, all right. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go right into the, the next. Uh, this is, again, Peter Kraft. He's the professor of philosophy at Boston College. Let's go ahead with that. Line number three is a sweeter version of the previous lie. It is that the world needs you, that you can save the world, or at least Western civilization, or America, or the culture. You are the Messiah. When you ride into Jerusalem in triumph, you will need an animal to ride on. And the donkey is very preferable to the elephant and certainly preferable to the lamb, but the real party animal is the jackass. <laughs> Mother Teresa once said to Malcolm Muggeridge, the brilliant and cynical British journalist who had become a Christian, but not yet a Catholic, Malcolm, you're a good man. Why don't you go all the way and become a Catholic? Malcolm replied, well, to answer you in your own words, Mother, I guess God sees that I'm a good man and he needs some good men outside his church as well as inside. And then Mother Teresa uttered three words. No, he doesn't. <laughs> and Malcolm writes in his autobiography, I could not answer that argument, so I became a Catholic. <laughs> Nobody ever won an argument with Mother Teresa except God. Except God. Uh, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Can I get that? When I die, I will not go to Washington, D.C. When my kids have gotten sick, I never once called on my congressional representative to come and heal them. Years ago, I swore an allegiance to a king who came to establish this upside down kingdom. A king who said that I did not come to be served, but to serve. A king who rejected the postures, slogans of the kingdoms of this world so how did the early church topple the empire? They did it by gathering on the first day of every week. They did it by being kind to their neighbors. They did it by being faithful in their marriages. They cared for orphans. The Old Testament did not require this. The New Testament did not require this. Love did. For some reason, 
those of us who call ourselves Christians or Jesus followers seems to have forgotten it. Too many Christians have lost their minds. We have vacated. We have left the middle. We don't ask questions. We just buy in. Of all of the people on the planet, we don't have an excuse because we have a king. The reactions revealed from the pandemic unearthed a reality about our faith claims. It revealed that we valued what every ideological group values, and that's winning. And it revealed that we've feared what every ideological group fears, and that's losing. The best way for us to lose our religious freedom is to pick up the weapons of this world, of the kingdom that Jesus' kingdom toppled. You've heard it said that actions speak louder than words. Reactions speak louder than either actions or words. Our reactions, when things don't go our way, say more about our confidence in Jesus than anything else we can say or do. Can I get Ephesians 1, 18 through 23? I started with this or ended with this last week, and I'm going to try to bring us back into that. Paul says that I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you were called, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. Can I get nonverbal? The Bible talks about this, the eyes of your heart. And, and in our groups and in our communities, we've been talking about the knowing. I, I was uh, thinking about Jeff earlier today, and uh, although he asked to be a part of this, uh, I didn't want to uh, offset Patrick, but we're going to work it out so we get, uh, we get some more of the... Uh, the exchange, shall we say. But anyway, the eyes of your heart, it's this knowing, it's the inside of you that understands. The Spirit speaks to you, and you have a receptor within your heart, and He, God, allows you, opens your eyes to see what it is that He wants to reveal to you in real time, and in this real space, and in this real world. And here they're asking that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. On the way in, I, I, I think I was talking to Dan, but I said, I, I heard this at a conference I was just at this week. He said, whatever you bring into the light becomes less dark. Whatever you bring into the light becomes less dark. And that is also about our hearts, that when we bring our hearts into the light, it becomes less dark. 
90% of all communication is nonverbal. And what we do or do not do speaks louder than anything we could say. More knowledge is not our weakness. Paul says, I hope that, you, that your eyes would be open, the eyes of your heart to be open, to know the hope for which you have been called. Do you know what the hope is that you've been called to, that you are being uh, drawn to? Do you know what the hope is, this upside-down kingdom that isn't about donkeys or elephants? Do you know what that hope is? And do you know about these riches of his glorious inheritance? Do you know what that is? Do you know what he's referring to? And do you know what it means to be a holy people? Again, set apart a single-use vessel, a single-use container, a single-use heart. That is the receptor of that spiritual uh, message that God is speaking to you and is revealing to you and is showing to you. And it is within it is this power for us who believe. There is a power for us who believe. There is no secret knowledge. There's nothing hidden. There is no new innovation. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to make some new incantation, concoction, development, anything like that. There's no new or enlightened thinking from the outside that can supplant the way of Jesus the conduct of those who follow. In the history of the planet, no one did humanity better than Jesus. No one. And no one ever will. He is the ideal for all humanity for all time. Can I get Jesus as the head? He guides and directs his church, this church, not my church. It's not an elder's church. It's not even your church, his church. And he guides, he directs, he decides. And we who are gifted in this community, again, thank you for Kiara. Thank you for Pat. Thank you for... Uh, so Will did the, the, the video stuff for me so I don't bother Dan all the time at work, and I still bother him all the time at work. And Dan is here juggling multiple screens. But thank you for your giftedness and your service to our community. Thank you for what you're doing within the body. But we who are gifted in the body are to fill everything in every way. What does that mean? What does it mean for you? to fill everything in every way. What does it mean? What does it look like? How will you know? And it says that all things are under his feet and he alone is able to balance mercy and judgment. Mercy and judgment. There are many things that we can see in the world that are not, I don't think, the way they're supposed to be. And yet we are not the ones who gets to decide what is and what isn't. But we are the ones who he has empowered, who he is communicating to, 
to deploy, to enact, to embody the kingdom as he would have it. Can I get the atonement video? We all long for the world to be good, for people to live in peace, act with love and justice, but there's a problem. Something compels us humans to constantly wreak havoc and destruction instead, and we call this evil. And from the Bible's point of view, evil ruins things in at least two ways. There's a direct effect of our evil, like when someone steals from another person, they've created injustice. Hey. You know, therefore, you know, they owe something to make it right. But there's another indirect effect of evil, because they've also ruined the environment of the relationship, creating a lack of trust, there's emotional damage. It's like vandalism, and they need to make that right, too. Now, many people believe, hey, God is good. He should be the one to just get rid of all the evil in the world. But let's be honest. I mean, the evil that I see everywhere out there, it's the same evil that's inside of me. We have all contributed, and, and we keep doing it. And so this kind of puts us in a bind. If God's going to rid the world of evil, he'll have to get rid of us. And this is what's so remarkable about the story of the Bible. This God is so good that not only is he going to rid the world of evil, he's going to do it without destroying humanity. So how is he going to do that? Well, early in the story of the Bible, we're introduced to this practice of animal sacrifice, which I know, it seems weird to us, but for the Israelites, it was a very powerful symbol of God's justice and of his grace. So remember, I'm a contributor to the evil that's in the world. I should be removed. But God is allowing this animal's life to be a substitute. It's symbolically dying in my place. And the biblical word for this is atonement, which means to cover over someone's death. But there's a second part to this ritual. Remember, evil also causes this relational vandalism. And in the Bible, this idea is described as polluting or defiling the land and making it unclean. So the priest would symbolically wash away the vandalism by sprinkling the animal's blood in different parts of the temple. So the animal's blood is cleaning things? Well, remember, this is a symbol, and it's a symbol that we're not used to. The blood represents life, and the sprinkling of the blood is this representation of how God is cleaning away these indirect consequences of evil in their community. In the Bible, this process is called purification. And so the temple and the land now become a clean space where God and his people can live together in peace. So this ritual makes things right between Israel and God. And more than that, the Israelites experience God's love and his grace through these symbols. And by being forgiven, ideally, this would compel them to become people of love and grace too. Right, that's the ideal, but it wasn't always happening. Right. So the prophet Isaiah, for example, he talks a lot about this. He opens his book by saying that the continual sacrifices of the Israelites had become meaningless because they were also allowing great evil in their midst, ignoring the poor and the oppressed. Even the Israelite kings were distorting justice. But Isaiah looked forward to a day when a new king from the line of David would come and deal with evil, but in a surprising way. The king would become a servant and not just serve, but also suffer and die for the evil committed by his own people. And his life would be offered as a sacrifice. And this is the promise Jesus believed he was fulfilling. He's the king of Israel suffering and dying on the cross. In fact, Jesus himself used Isaiah's words when he said that he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And that word ransom refers to a sacrifice of atonement. And so all over the New Testament, we hear about how Jesus' death was an atoning sacrifice for us. It covered the debt that humans owe God for contributing to all of the evil and death in his world. But the New Testament authors also talk about Jesus' death as providing purification. And so we hear about Jesus' blood as a symbol of his life, having this ability to wash away the vandalism that evil has caused in us and around us so we can now live at peace with God. So that's the meaning behind Jesus' death. But there's more to the story. Yeah, the New Testament makes this powerful claim that Jesus' death was not final. He rose from the dead. And so he's the sacrifice who broke the power of death and evil, which means that he lives on to offer his life to anyone who will accept it. He is the perfect sacrifice to which all the previous sacrifices were pointing all along. 
So because of Jesus, the early Christians stopped participating in the ritual of animal sacrifice. But they were given new rituals. There are two that Jesus taught his followers to perform. The first is called baptism. Just as Jesus died, so going into the water becomes this personal connection you now have to his death. And in coming out of the water, you, so to speak, come back to life with Jesus. So baptism is the sacred ritual that joins your story to Jesus' death and his resurrection. The second ritual is called the Lord's Supper, which is a reenactment of Jesus' last meal with his disciples. And he used bread and wine to portray his coming death as a sacrifice. And so now, followers of Jesus, they take the bread and the cup regularly to remember and to participate in the power of Jesus' death and in his life. So these rituals, they remind us of God's love and encourage us to live a life of love and grace. But they do more than that. They connect us to a new life source. The very power that brought Jesus back from the dead is the same power that can deal with the evil in our own lives and transform us into people who lead lives of love and peace. Had you guys seen that one before? No? New one? Bibleproject.org has so many beautiful uh, vignettes. They have ideas. They have book by, um, stories. They, they've got anything you want to look at. They've also got uh, podcasts. If you want to go deeper in any of these things and you're a podcaster, th this is the place to go. I don't get royalties, so that's another thing. Can I get Hebrews 10? When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These were offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away the sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for, from that time until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering... He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Can I get faith in works? God does not require your blood or anyone else's blood to renew or revive any circumstances because of our falling short. But... He is desiring your hands and your feet and your heart. He doesn't need you to sacrifice. Not like that. He is asking for your hands and your feet and your heart. Verse 15. It says, And then the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, for in those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. He will write them on our hearts. He'll put them on our hearts and write them in our minds. Again, Jeff was talking about being the path of least resistance. And although he did not grow up in the church, he does not know the scriptures the way you and I might know the scriptures from study or through years of sitting in a service. He has opened his heart up. He has assumed this posture of receptivity. And oftentimes, not always, Ellen, I understand, but oftentimes he is able to convey that message as clearly as I or anyone else can. He didn't require the reading in order for him to receive. 
and we can also read to affirm and know which spirit is speaking to us. Verse 17, and then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Can I get Joel 2? We've been, we've been talking about this where Jesus walked the planet. He embodied the ideal. He behaved in a way no one ever had and no one ever will. And then he took on this servant nature, received death, even death on a cross, and God affirmed his behavior, his conduct, his kingdom by rising him from the dead. After 40 days... He poured out his spirit. This is the Pentecost moment. This is the 50 days later where his spirit was poured out on men and women, the young and the old, so that they could know, so that they could be uh, redeemed and refreshed and revived. God is writing his laws on our minds and placing them in our hearts because it's an inside job. It's not an outside issue. Every time that you and I have ever fallen short of what God designed for us, every time, Jesus' Jesus' sacrifice covered. And every time we're going to fall short, Jesus' sacrifice covered. So here's my question before we go into communion. I, I want to kind of get the graffiti. Uh, Isabel and I, we were going through Colorado, and we stopped at Denver, and they had this graffiti walk. It's like an art crawl, but this was the art that we were walking by. It's actually right next to a, a, a drainage ditch. It, it was absolutely disgusting. It was as if they said, well, what could we do with this really horrible part of, the, of this? It would take so much money to clean that up. Why don't we just call it art? And there it is. It was just the strangest, most disturbing thing. Uh, I, again, I, I'm sure it was beautiful to some. I did not see the beauty in it. Where are the places you feel the graffiti of your sin, of your falling short? I want to use those words. Where do you feel the graffiti? Where has the relationship been tarnished or muddied? Where has that happened? Where is that in your life? Or even look bigger or badder or broader than that. Think about our culture. Think about our cities whether Eau Claire or Chippewa or anywhere else you might live. Where are those places where the relationships have been distorted because of our falling short? Our lives need to be cleaned up inside out so that we can become the hands and feet. But then I also, can I get your transformation? I also want to challenge you at looking at the world with eyes of redemption, of what could be. Um, part of my journey was I rehabbed houses until I, I lost the use of my arm. I can't, I can't hammer overhead anymore, so I can't do the job as well. But we used to look for houses like that, and we tried to make them look like this. And it's a, it's a, a way of seeing it's a way of looking beyond the broken and the graffiti to what could be, what could happen. And again, the, the house is just a physical manifestation, but I want you to think about your relationships. Think about the graffiti there, the distortion. What might happen? happen? What could be done to add value, to bring order, to restore, 
to build up and not tear down. We're going to go into communion. I'm going to pray, I think, while we do this. I think Pat could use some help. If you guys could.